Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Donna Martinez. Welcome to another edition of Shaftesbury Society, coming to you live from Midtown Raleigh here at the headquarters of the John Locke Foundation. We're so glad you're along for what we know is going to be a really interesting and informative discussion about election integrity, not only in North Carolina, but what is happening across the United States. So the debate, as we know, is now intensifying over what actually constitutes election integrity and what some people say is voter suppression. It's even now fashionable for the woke business community to decide whether or not they agree with a state's election laws. Our own governor has now signed a letter opposing what he deems to be restrictions on voting and asking business leaders, quote, to add their voices to the growing chorus of corporations standing on the right side of history. That is from the letter that our governor signed. So today we're going to be talking about our own elections, whether or not they are secure, and some reforms that have been recommended in our state legislature. We're also going to talk about H.R. 1. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's resolution that would fundamentally change the way elections are handled here in our country if it were to become law. Joining us today, we have another great panel. Representative Gray Mills represents Iredell County. He is the chairman of the House Election Law and Campaign Finance Reform Committee. Representative Ted Davis represents New Hanover County. He sits on that House Elections Committee. He's also chairman of Judiciary One. Bradley Smith is a guest once again here on Shaftesbury Society. He was with us a few weeks ago. He is the chairman of the Institute for Free Speech. He is the former chairman of the Federal Election Commission. And my colleague here at the John Locke Foundation, Dr. Andy Jackson. Andy is director of the Civitas Center for Public Integrity. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, Representatives uh, Mills and Davis, give us a sense of how you see the election landscape in North Carolina right now. Representative Mills, let's start with you. Well, good afternoon, Donna. First, let me thank you for that kind introduction and thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss elections, election law, uh, election integrity with you and the other panelists. I'm excited to be here because as you know, elections is one of those issues that has a whole lot of momentum behind it right now in North Carolina, in the General Assembly, and in fact, across, across our nation. I receive a lot of phone calls every week, Donna, from constituents and from people across the state I receive a lot of emails from people across the state, and they are concerned about our elections. They want to know that our elections are fair. They want to know that the results are correct, and they want to know that the election process is secure. Now, I think to begin looking at that, we ought to look back at 2020, and, um, and that was a historic election. We had over five and a half million ballots cast in North Carolina. Uh, we had um, over 1 million cast absentee ballots, votes by mail, and that was a record. And of course, we had the closest statewide contest in modern history, that being the um, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court race. And, you know, a lot of things went well in 2020. For instance, our voting machines, we didn't have the same problems some other states have, but our people and our citizens still have concerns, and I think rightfully so, regarding our election process. What can we do to make it better? Um, our election results, you know, were they correct? People have the right to ask these questions of us, uh, members of the General Assembly and, and, every, and, and other places, and there are some things that we can look at, Don, and I think one of those things is absentee by mail. What can we do to improve that process? Another thing is the timing of elections and, and getting the results in. I think that the longer that time goes by after an election, that we still don't have a clear cut answer or, or the results of the election, that's an issue. And I think also uh, money in elections. Now I'm not talking about money in politics. I'm talking about private donations to local boards. You know, that was done in 2020. And a lot of people are asking the question, hey, why is that? Why did they go to some local boards and not others? And as you know, you mentioned Senate Bill 326. It's filed by Senators Daniel, Newton, and Heiss. I'm looking forward to discussing that. That addresses some of those issues. We can start there. Um, and I look forward to this discussion with you and the other panelists. All sorts of things um, on the table here and a lot to unpack, which we're going to be doing later on as we uh, make our way through the hour. Representative Davis, how do you see things? 
I see that we need to address a lot of issues uh, in order to make our elections more secure. Uh, to touch a little bit on what Gray said, uh, we need to update and clean up our voter rolls. I mean, there are people who have died that need to be removed from the voter rolls. There are unreported moves of people uh, that need to be removed. There are people that are registered to vote in more one county that it needs to be specified which county they vote in and then removed from the other. Um, we, we do need election law reform, like early voting. I mean, we had, well, I believe it was 17 days of early voting. I mean, that's just entirely too long. Uh, we, we need to shorten that up if we're gonna have it at all. And like Gray alluded to absentee ballots, we need to tighten that up. But one thing that uh, Gray mentioned that I'll, I'll expand on just for a little bit is I am a primary sponsor on a bill that's gonna be introduced in the house that is to prohibit the private funding of elections. Uh, so that is something that that is in the mix that we are going to address. But uh, I do appreciate you allowing me to be here, and I look forward to the discussion. And uh, thank you very much. All right, we're going to talk more about um, that bill you were talking about a little bit later here in the hour. Let's go over to Chairman um, Smith. You know, you formerly were the chairman of the Federal Election Commission, so you know the ins and outs of of pretty much everything how election law works across the country and what the concerns are. But the big thing that's been really front and center for a number of weeks now, Chairman Smith, is H.R. 1. How do you see the national landscape here as we face some, some big decision points about how elections are going to be conducted and, and who's in charge? Sure. Thanks, Donna. And, and thanks for having me back, uh, back to talk to the folks here at LOCK. Um, so H.R. 1, let me, let me, by the way, I need to preface this by noting that the Institute for Free Speech doesn't take a position on non-speech issues as the portions of H.R. 1 or portions of state law that regulate hours of voting, absentee voting, that sort of thing. We're concerned about the issues pertaining to speech. So I'm speaking my personal capacity on, on most of these topics. But H.R. 1 is basically a wish list of uh, democratic political positions include a wide variety of things, some only tangentially related to elections, such as there's a piece in there about the need for DC statehood. Uh, and then it's got, you know, independent or supposedly independent commissions required for state redistricting. Uh, it's got uh, pre-registration of 17 uh, year olds to vote, um, same day registration. But basically what it does is it would try to federalize all of these issues and take control away from the states so that each state would have to have a minimum amount of early voting. States would have to have uniform positions, essentially on voter ID laws, on registration, and so on. And in that respect, it's not only a democratic power grab, it's a federal power grab. And one that doesn't allow for the fact that the states are very different and have generally done a pretty good job of handling their elections. Some states have longer polling hours, shorter polling hours. Some states have same day registration. Other states require registration in advance. You know, states do things that seem to fit their political culture and, and what they think works. It's the old, you know, laboratory of democracy, so to speak, in figuring out what, what works. So HR1 is, is a, a very partisan bill and it's a very uh, federalizing bill. And I think on both of those counts, that's a bad way to go about making law. I think the, the biggest problem in American elections today, the, the, the gorilla in the room that nobody wants to talk about sometimes is the fact that a huge percentage of Americans not just Republicans, but also Democrats, it's almost identical between the parties, simply do not trust the vote counts that come in. It's not that they think the election's unfair from the media or the Russians interfering or that sort of thing, although they think that too, but they actually simply do not believe that the vote counts are accurate. And that is a huge problem. And it's a, a reason to think about trying to, to address election uh, issues. I think that we should not be super concerned about fraud in the sense that I think there's very little fraud in American elections compared to our history. We're running really clean elections now. But simultaneously, we're in a position where there have never been fewer obstacles to voting in the United States than there are today. Voting has never been easier or more convenient. And the idea of comparing anything that attempts to bring some sense of order to elections or address fraud on the margins, which up until a year ago is common knowledge uh, in any political science conference in the country that absentee ballots were more suspect of fraud than in-person voting. You know, so, so we have those kinds of 
the idea that we can't address those kinds of things now because they're going to be called Jim Crow is also simply preposterous. And, and we need to have everybody sort of tone down the rhetoric and think about how do we make it accessible and easy for people to vote while at the same time protecting the integrity of elections and thinking about what elections are supposed to do. I think voting should be a public act that people, you know, we need to allow for people who can't vote on election day, but for the most part, voting should be something that you do publicly on election day that we come together and we, and we think about our job in uh, governing ourselves. And if we try to set up a system in which the sole criteria for good election is how many people we got to vote and how convenient we made it for them to vote, we shouldn't be surprised when voters increasingly become narcissistic in their voting patterns, when they don't care about the public interest, when they just say, this is for me, when they don't think about their vote deeply because it's just easier easier than voting for the top person or American Idol. And I think that's the kind of approach we need to take as we think about these issues more than fraud per se, or the idea that th this kind of preposterous idea that there's some new Jim Crow in the United States. It's interesting. I've not heard that phrase before, narcissistic in voting. Maybe we can chat a little bit more uh, about that as we go on as well. But to your point, Chairman Smith, about dis distrust, uh, those who are with us each Monday here at Shaftesbury Society probably recall that just last month we had the latest Civitas poll that showed incredible distrust about what the 2022 elections will bring here in North Carolina. Just shy of half of North Carolina likely voters said that they thought the elections would be free and fair in 2022. And I believe it was about 40 percent who said outright they did not believe the elections would be free and fair in our state next year. So this is a big concern. By the way, you can find that poll at johnlock.org. If you go up to the upper right-hand corner of the, uh, the home page, click on polls, just hit the tab there, and you'll find um, all of those results. And I think one of my colleagues is probably going to be uh, posting in the comments section of our Facebook page here that poll as well, so you can get a look about um, how North Carolinians are feeling about all of this. Well, election integrity is one of the key issues that we consider to be really important here at the John Locke Foundation. And in fact, uh, my colleague, Dr. Andy Jackson, is the director of the Civitas Center for Public Integrity here. Andy, I know that you have been uh, researching all of these issues, uh, North Carolina issues, and how we achieve uh, free and fair elections that people believe in. And you've made some recommendations. Andy, I want to turn the virtual floor over to you for a few minutes here to talk about how you think North Carolina should go forward. Then we'll bring um, all the panel back in to talk about those. Um, uh, so I've made a set of recommendations and some of those have already been translated into, let me go ahead and pop this up. Some of those have already been translated into, there we go. Sorry, technical issues and from beginning. All right, and so some of them have already been put into bills. I mean, not necessarily from me directly uh, into bills. Uh, people, obviously, when people have good ideas, it comes from more than one source. Um, so I'm gonna go over those briefly. Um, one thing I did wanna talk about um, is kind of a overarching theme with these. And, and there's two basic points to this. One, uh, as previously mentioned, voters should feel confident that the elections were conducted freely and fairly, uh, that the, the vote was correct, that everybody who was legally entitled to vote and wants to vote was able to vote. People that were not legally entitled to vote did not vote, uh, therefore diluting the votes of others. Um, also that there are reasonable measures such as voter ID uh, that can protect the integrity of elections without being an undue burden on the right to vote. It's not a matter of, of either or, it's striking a correct balance. Um, so with that in mind, I'm gonna take a look at some of the proposals. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list uh, that are already before the General Assembly. And then we'll take a look at some other possible proposals. And I'm sure uh, some of the representatives here has, as have already mentioned, we'll have bring some other ideas to the table. Um, the first one is kind of our general uh, election integrity bill in this session, which is uh, Senate Bill 326. Um, it removes the postmark exception. Right now under North Carolina law, uh, election day is the deadline. There is an ex there's a couple of exceptions, one for military overseas, and that's covered by federal law. 
And the other one is under North Carolina law, if you get a postmark on it and it arrives within three days. Um, we saw some problems with uh, confusion about whether or not the postmark was correct or not correct. There was testimony um, at one county board of elections where they actually had to bring in a postal worker to say, oh, I'm sorry, I stamped the wrong day date on the postmark. So you should count these. Um, and so fixing that would put North Carolina in the norm. Right now, 32 states require ballots to be submitted I mean, or received, not just put in the mail, by election day or before election day. So North Carolina would become more normal uh, that way. Um, next thing is we would expand the period uh, from the time where you submit uh, your request for an absentee ballot to election day. Currently it's seven days. Uh, this bill would bring it out to 14. That's in keeping with post uh, office recommendations because you've got to request the ballot. The ballot comes to you, you fill it out, you submit it. And trying to get all that done in seven days clearly is a difficult task. Um, and so this would actually kind of make North Carolina law normed with the expectations of the US Postal Service. Um, also, uh, $5 million for helping people acquire their free IDs, incl including setting up mobile units to help people. Um, the state really is bending over backwards, or the General Assembly is bending over backwards here to try to make sure that any person who wants to vote and doesn't have any form of photo ID is able to get it. Um, and so that's helpful. Uh, the other one, and this has already been mentioned, is banning so-called Zuckbucks, named after Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and he had donated most of his money um, to a group called the Center for Tech and Civil Life. Um, and that group made donations, uh, grants, uh, to various boards of elections, county boards, state boards, all over the country. Um, now, the people that run that were former founders of this group called the New Organizing Institute that the Washington Post described as the Hogwarts of Democratic Party uh, wizardry. Um, so these this is a partisan group, or at least the people that run it are experienced partisans. Um, I did my own analysis and I found out uh, that this particular group had donated to 33 counties in North Carolina. Um, and I'll just use the results of one election um, here, but the 33 counties that they donated backed uh, Democrat Cal Cunningham, 52.7% to 47.3% in our last senatorial election. Um, and the 67 counties where that did not receive grants from this organization went for Tom Tillis, 53.6 to 46.4. Um, now, was this bias in donations intentional? There's no proof of that, but it exists. Um, and this is the kind of things that people will question when they see election results. Um, and we should remove uh, that kind of privatization of election conduct. These are one of the, these are, you know, I like privatizing a lot of things if we can do it, uh, garbage service, whatnot, but elections are probably not one of the things we want to privatize. Um, <clears throat> another bill uh, that is coming in is, that's been proposed, I don't know how far it's gonna go, is uh, uh, HB 171, that's gonna shift the burden of proof. Right now, if somebody says, well, you know, Jane Doe, she's running for sheriff, but she doesn't actually live in the county, uh, under current law, they're going to have a hearing and Jane Doe, Doe has to establish that she in fact lives in the county. Um, this would shift the burden of proof on a preponderance of evidence level, if not beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, to the person making the claim. I, there's been a lot of debate on this one. I really don't take a position on it um, because there's you know good and bad going both ways on that, but it's there and we don't know how far it's going to get. My personal favorite because if you don't get this one right, nothing else is really gonna matter. I mean, a bit of an overstatement, but not too much of one. Uh, there's a couple of bills that will ban uh, collusive lawsuit settlements. Uh, this is what we saw uh, last September with the State Board of Elections and Democratic Attorney Mark Elias, uh, where they changed a couple of different parts of North Carolina law, uh, a federal judge, later found that at least some of those changes were a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, 
because you were changing the rules of the election after people had already been voting. Um, but he couldn't overturn it uh, because the Supreme Court in this uh, is called the Purcell principle. Basically, federal courts can't change uh, election rules close to an election. But this that limit left the door open for the state court to make this last minute change after people had already voted. And so this bill would say if there are legislative defendants involved, including intervening defendants, that you can't have a settlement because there were legislative defendants involved in that case. Uh, but uh, the judge in the case said, well, we don't have to include them. Uh, this law would make it so that they have to be included in the settlement so that you don't have the executive branch basically picking a friendly lawsuit to settle uh, and going against the law as written by the legislative branch. It's an essential protection of our separation of powers. Um, there's a bunch of redistricting bills. I'm not gonna review them all. Um, they even have one where, uh, and I won't get into the weeds too much where they're putting a essentially a commission in charge of the county clustering, which is a unique thing we have in North Carolina law. Um, if we have time, we'll explain it in detail, but it's the first phase of redistricting before you even draw districts. Um, there's a bill about that and there's a ton of other ones. Um, also uh, HB uh, 542, and there's a Senate version, which I, I dub son of HR1. It's basically all the bills that progressives have been uh, trying to put in the legislature for probably the last three, four or five years. They just combined them all up in a big ball and said, we're going to put this all in one proposal. Um, it's been proposed, it's been submitted, uh, but not gonna go anywhere on this one. And there's a whole lot of reasons why we don't need to get into the details on that. So this is at least a partial list of what we've got now. And there's a few things that I would like to see um, uh, move forward. Uh, one is and this is not necessarily a bill that needs to be written because the North Carolina State Board of Elections already has authority from the General Assembly to enter into agreements with other states for cross-checking data. Uh, people that move from North Carolina to another state, uh, you know, if that state finds out and if, if somebody registered to vote in say Nebraska from, when they move from North Carolina, and they check the box saying, oh, I moved from North Carolina, then Nebraska is supposed to inform North Carolina. But if that box isn't checked um, or they just forget it, then North Carolina will never know that this person has gotten off of the voter rolls in North Carolina, in fact, uh, when they moved to Nebraska, but, uh, but they're still, their name is still on the list here. And there's this organization called the Electronic Registration Information Center. Um, there's about 30 states that are currently members, including South Carolina, Georgia, Virginia, a lot of our neighbors. Um, and what they do is these states share their data, DMV data, voter registration data, other data that they get. This organization also buys federal data from the post office and the, and the death records from the Social Security Administration, shares those with all member states. And that helps each of those states better clean up their voting rolls. Uh, North Carolina used to be um, uh, joined up with another group called Crosscheck. Uh, they got shut down because of problems with security of their data. And we don't know if they're ever going to bring that group back. That had the advantage of being free. Unfortunately, Eric is not free. There are There is some funding issues. So during budget negotiations, this would have to be worked out there. Um, another one I'd like to see is requiring a record of people who assist voters in the voting booth, uh, just sign a log. Who are you? What's your relationship to the person? Um, because we don't know who all is going unless somebody observes somebody escorting multiple people in or assisting people that they're not supposed to. Uh, there was a recent case in the 2020 election in Anson County where a gentleman was assisting uh, several dozen people uh, in an early voting site, basically grabbing him in the parking lot, uh, let me go in with you. I don't know why people allowed him to do that, but a lot of voters did. Maybe they didn't know any better. Um, so this isn't necessarily banning that because there's a good reason some people need assistance uh, you know, if they're handicapped or whatnot, but we should know that. And we already know, uh, there's already a requirement to log people who assist absentee voters. So this would just be expanding current law to in-person voting. Um, the last one is 
This is one I hope isn't needed to become a law. Uh, North Carolina law says that you can have two observers from each party at a time and they can be relieved after four hours. Uh, the State Board of Elections is trying to change that. They have a meeting, a hearing on May 6th, where they're gonna be receiving public comment, where they're going to limit uh, precinct specific observers to two a day. So for the whole 13 hours, you can only have uh, two people there. Now you can also have a third person in some precincts that are countywide at large observers or statewide at large observers. But this is a big step back from transparency of elections. Most county boards that I've talked to, uh, chair people have said, we at a lot of precincts will have more than two observers in a day. And so this, I'm hoping that if there's enough of an uproar about this, that this will get shut down either by the State Board of Elections itself or by the Rules Review Commission, which has to approve of all any rules changes that the State Board wants. Um, if that doesn't stop it, then there may be a need for the legislature to clarify, which in my mind is already very clear that it's two every four hours, not two in a day. Um, so those are the things that are already in the mix, things and also a few things that I hope will be in the mix soon. All right, Andy, thank you very much for that. that. That's very helpful. All right, let's bring back in our panelists, if we could. Uh, Representative Gray Mills, Representative Ted Davis, and uh, Bradley Smith, who is chairman of the Institute for Free Speech and the uh, former chairman of the Federal Election Commission. Representative Mills and Davis, what's your reaction to uh, some of the, the items that Andy talked about? What is at the top of your list that you would like to see in order to have uh, more election integrity in North Carolina. Well, regarding one of Andy's slides, and thank you for that, Andy. That was, that was a lot of good information. Uh, you mentioned several bills that are currently uh, pending in the General Assembly. And of course, we've already mentioned the Senate Bill 326. Mm -hmm. I suspect that you will see broad support both in the House and in the Senate for Senate Bill 326 and other bills that I believe are coming forward that are similar um, for those reasons that, uh, that Andy uh, mentioned. Um, and, and I won't, we can go into that later. I just wanna uh, highlight the bills that he, he mentioned. The next one he mentioned was House Bill 171. That's the candidate challenge. Andy, we actually uh, heard that in committee. It was discussion only, it was displaced, but the uh, House Election Law and Campaign Finance Reform Committee did, um, did hear uh, the bill um, presentation of that just this past week. Mm -hmm. And then the sue and settle, you mentioned that, uh, you had a couple of bills numbered down, I believe you, one of them was House Bill 606. Yeah, that's an issue that I think we need to uh, take a serious look at. Now, as you know, um, Director Brinson Bell came, testified uh, or gave testimony in the House um, Election Law Committee some months ago. She also did it in the Senate, but this was an issue that came up uh, during the discussions with her, you know, back in 2020, it had a bipartisan bill passed the House with, with what, 105 votes, had broad bipartisan support. But following that, then you had the collusive lawsuit, uh, the settlement, um, you know, and, and we need to look at that. And we need to look at some provisions that uh, we can do to address that situation. I do know some members are, are uh, considering uh, legislation in that, in that regard. Um, your other slide, uh, I believe you said uh, further considerations that you'd like to see. It make a lot of sense. The, the uh, registration info center that you mentioned, we are, there's a lot of um, interest in that. Uh, it makes a lot of good sense. As you said, 30 states already have it. You know, I, is it right for North Carolina? Something we definitely need, need to consider. And the um, poll watchers that you mentioned. Uh, yeah, May 6th is the hearing date. We're keeping a close eye on that. Uh, and seeing what's gonna happen. You said, hopefully it doesn't require legislation. Uh, we'll see, but I agree with you. It needs to be two every four hours, not, not two a day. So we'll see what uh, May 6 brings. Representative Davis, in Andy's presentation, he referred to the Zuck Bucks, the private funding 
Earlier um, in our forum here, Representative Davis, you made reference to private funding of elections. Is Zuckbucks what you're talking about? If I could touch on something that we talked about, House Bill 606, which prohibited collusive settlements by the Attorney General, that is in my Judiciary One Committee. Uh, it was just placed there, and I do intend to proceed with a hearing on that as, as, as soon as possible. Um, another bill I'll just mention before answering your question is there's a House Joint Resolution 330 that's moving through the House, and basically what it is is North Carolina's opposition to any federal action infringing upon the state's constitutional authority to manage control and administer elections. It's, it's, it's an uh, indirect response to federal uh, House Resolution 1. Uh, as you know, the Constitution of the United States vests power uh, in the states to manage, control, and administer each state's own election laws. And as was uh, referenced, that House Resolution 1 will destroy that. It, it's really an attempt, in my opinion, I, I agree with our, our Lieutenant Governor that that is really a bill to design to keep Democrats in power and not to ensure that all citizens have the right to vote. So and hopefully that will go that through bill? the House. What's the number on that bill, Representative Davis, that would be um, in direct opposition to H.R. 1, a reaction it, to? Sure. It's, it's House Joint Resolution 330. Thank you. Uh, you sure. It's, it's moving through the committee process in the House now, and I, I will certainly support it. Um, the bill that is being drafted uh, and, and actually is, should be filed pretty soon that I, I mentioned earlier that I'm a primary sponsor on really deals with trying to prohibit what we talked about, the private funding of elections. And basically what that bill says is that the State Board of Elections shall not solicit, take, or otherwise accept from any person any contribution, donation, or anything else of value for purposes of conducting, conducting state or local elections in the state. It further says that no county board of commissioners, elected municipal officials, or county board of elections shall solicit, take, or otherwise accept from any person, any contribution, donation, or anything else of value for purposes of conducting state or local elections in this state. All costs and expenses relating to elections shall be paid by with public funds, that being funds derived from taxes, fees, and other sources of public revenue lawfully appropriated by the General Assembly. So th this is an attempt uh, to try to address all this private money that's being funneled in uh, for these elections, a lot that we know about and a lot that we don't know about. Uh, I know I ran into that uh, last election with, with my opponent, so much money coming in from out of state uh, and also things being done where we don't know who paid for, you know, or, or who was behind it all. So hopefully that will help to address that. So Andy, is that um, description, would that address your Zuck Bucks issue? Oh, certainly. Uh, it would ban the private funding of elections, which is essentially what we need to have happen. Chairman Smith, I'd like to bring you in here because you just heard Representative Davis say that there is a House Joint Resolution uh, that would look at, to be a direct response to the potential of H.R. 1. Um, is that new or is, is North Carolina unique in that or are other states really taking notice of, of uh, the ramifications of H.R. 1 as well? Chairman Smith, are you there's there? There's been a lot of pushback on HR uh, one, but um, I think that, and I don't know exactly what states are doing formally. The the point to remember, though, is that ultimately, uh, I mean, the states can't block it through uh, such legislative action. So on. it's going to have to go to the courts to make a federalism case that the government, federal government has exceeded its power. And there are certain cases, at least parts of HR1, where the federal government probably has not exceeded its power, although it has broken norms. Remember all the talk about breaking norms for four years, right? And that these are things that are normally left to, to state governments and probably should be left to state governments. There are areas, though, where I think it's very vulnerable to constitutional challenge. 
And I think it's helpful to have states go on record on this. I think a couple other uh, points, by the way, that are, are, are very valuable. One, uh, Andy mentioned the Purcell principle that, that tells courts they shouldn't act late in the day to change rules. I think one of the big problems we're having now is that courts actually are far too ready to make changes to election laws. And this adds to this kind of sense of chaos and the sense that no one is in control. And you know, if you can go to any judge and get a decision, then you're, you know, you're sort of off and running. This gets even worse when we talk about election day administration, like judges making last minute decisions. Oh, let's keep the polls up for another two hours. Uh, among practitioners, it's, it's well known that the rule of law on election day is whatever you can find one local you know, trial court judge somewhere in the state to agree to do. Because if you can find him, that's it. There's no time for an appeal. And he's going to give an order and the state officials will typically feel that they have to comply with it. And I think that's the kind of thing that leads people to a high degree of distrust in the process, a sense that the process is this open to political manipulation. Um, and uh, so... So I think that's another one of the issues that is problematic. I think also, uh, you know, the provision that Representative Davis talked about regarding settlements is a very good one. Collusive settlements are a real potential problem here, given the partisanship that may be involved. And I, I think the states not only should try to prohibit those, but they should also make sure that the state legislature has a right to intervene in any challenges to state laws. That should be part of the statute is that the legislature has a right to intervene and join as a defendant because you can't have a situation where an executive branch official just kind of gets together with somebody he agrees with that he didn't like the law and say, yeah, sure, let, let's do that. So all of these are, are good changes and I'm, and I'm glad to see that uh, they're being pursued in, in North Carolina and other states. But again, on the specific question of HR1, ultimately that's gonna to have to be something that's gonna to have to be blocked in Congress. And if it's not blocked in Congress, then, then we're gonna end up with constitutional litigation in the federal courts. That makes, of course, the 2022 election uh, even more vital and, and critical. And we keep saying that as issue after issue starts to build up and we realize that the makeup of the United States Senate will um, definitely determine um, the future course of, of our country. Well, the state of Georgia, of course, has been in the news for their election laws. And uh, reaction to that, we now have the woke business culture. Um, the Major League Baseball has now pulled uh, the All-Star game out of Atlanta, along with the draft as well. Our own governor here in North Carolina, Roy Cooper, signed a letter. By the way, Carolina Journal reported on this, so be sure and check out carolinajournal.com and look for this story, and you can see what exactly is in that letter and what the governor signed on to. But in part, uh, Governor Cooper uh, and others say in this letter that they are asking businesses to add their voices to the growing chorus of corporations standing on the right side of history. So that is uh, Governor Cooper in the progressive left's view. Well, very interesting that last week, our Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson, who is the first African-American elected to that post in North Carolina, was one of the people who was before a U.S. House subcommittee that was looking at issues of election law, election integrity. And he had some very interesting and fiery comments um, to, uh, to give to the committee, including Something that I want to play here as part of this discussion and then get your reaction to this, uh, panelists. Andy, if you could play that clip of the lieutenant governor, um, please do so. Today, we hear Georgia law being compared to Jim Crow. The black voices are being silenced and the black voices are being kept out. How? By bullets? By bombs? By nooses? No. By requiring a free ID to secure the vote. Let me say that again, by requiring a free ID to secure the vote. How absolutely preposterous. Am I to believe that black Americans who have overcome the atrocities of slavery, who were victorious in the civil rights movement, and now sit in the highest levels of this government cannot figure out how to get a free ID to secure their votes? That they need to be coddled by politicians because they don't think we can figure out how to make our voices heard. Are you kidding me? The notion that black people must be protected from a free ID to secure their votes is not just insane, it is insulting. Just a few days ago, excuse me, uh, uh, and let me tell you something about this. This is, doesn't have anything to do with justice. This has everything to do with power. 
just a few days ago, Vice President, the Vice President went to the very place that I mentioned, the Woolworth counter in Greensboro. But you know who wasn't there? You know who wasn't invited? My good friend Clarence Henderson, who is a civil rights icon. He sat at that counter and endured the suffering and pain to make sure that black voices were heard. And why was he left out? Because he's of a different political persuasion. You might ask why this is so, and I'll tell you plainly. The goal of some individuals in government is not to hear the voices of black Americans at all. It's to hear the voices that fit their narratives and ultimately help keep power with one group. And that's what this all is all about. It's about power. Just look at HR1. It's despicable. The entire thing is designed to keep one party in power and ensure they stay there indefinitely. How do they plan to do that? By taking away the rights of states given by the Constitution to govern their own election, to mandate a wish list, a partisan, a partisan wish list that comes down from that federal government. All right, that is Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson. And if you would like to see the video of that and the, the full remarks from the Lieutenant Governor, you can find that in our blog, Locker Room. Just go to johnlock.org, scroll down the page, and there's a link to the Locker Room right there, and you can watch his, his full comments. Chairman Smith, um, so the Georgia voting law, there are people who say that it is voter suppression. What do you see in the Georgia voting law? Well, I, I think it's a very good law that that attempts to uh, strike a, a good balance um, between various, you know, competing concerns. For example, let, let's start with one of the most absurd uh, challenges to the law is people are, well, the law prohibits someone from giving somebody water if they're in line to vote. Um, almost every state in the country has a similar law to that. Uh, here in Ohio, for example, you're not allowed within 150 feet of a polling place and you're not allowed within 10 feet of any voter in line if the line extends beyond that 150 foot limit. And you'll find a law like that in virtually every state. In Georgia, they actually had a problem that their prior law simply said you couldn't campaign close to voters or close to the site. And so people were actually going down the line, passing out uh, you know, refreshments and so on that were branded with candidates names or you know they were talk they would use that to talk about the candidates and so on so the state just simply decided to make it explicit that this includes food provision of food and drink of course any voter can take food into line they can take drink into line um, you know the the poll workers can provide uh, water vending machines can be there if groups actually want to provide water to people standing in line they can provide it to the poll workers who can distribute it to folks in line so you just have this sort of absurd attack that bears almost no resemblance to reality uh, going on and that's true of many of the provisions in the law uh, and, and again, I, I totally agree with Lieutenant Governor Robinson that this, this kind of comparing it to Jim Crow is just insulting to everybody and the memory of everybody who lived with Jim Crow, who fought against Jim Crow. And, and it keeps us from having a realistic, normal debate on uh, voting and, and, and politics here. You know, the state uh, decreased early voting days from 19 to 17 but guaranteed that there would be more hours to vote during those early voting days. This is not exactly uh, sicking the dogs on protesters at the bridge. And so uh, we're having this discussion that simply bears no real connection to reality and it makes it very hard to get meaningful voter reform that will help to restore voter confidence in election results. And Representative Mills and, and Davis, you know, you're right now in the arena, so you are trying to have a discussion of election reform based on fact and based on lots of details about where North Carolina election law should go. Are you finding that you are facing um, a narrative that really doesn't want to look at facts but really just wants to communicate a certain point of view about election law? Well, I think... Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you go ahead, Greg. No, go ahead, Ted. Well, it, what, what really gets me is I'm a big proponent of voter identification. And you hear all this stuff about, oh, it's suppressive and this and that. And, and, and as was talked about earlier, I mean, the state's bending over backwards to provide people a free voter ID. And, and two things I'll just say that to me shows the hypocrisy of, of the Democratic Party. And one is, Early on, when Governor Beverly Perdue 
was was the governor, there was a voter ID bill that, that she vetoed. But guess what you had to have to go to her inaugural ceremony of, of photo identification? Uh, I've still got a notice that was sent out in 2015 for an NAACP protest march that says a list of things that you were told to bring. One of them was a photo ID. So photos IDs are necessary for protest march. Photo IDs are necessary for inaugural uh, parties, but not so you'd be able to vote. I, I, I just... That is something that I really think needs to be done. And as far as the Georgia law, uh, Donna, I don't look at it as suppressing voting. What I look at it is suppressing voter fraud and ensuring fair elections. And I, I'm really disappointed how it seems more and more that uh, corporations, companies, especially the NACP and sports, uh, have these reactions when a state passes some sort of legislation like they did with the HB2 that we you know, previously passed in, in North Carolina, and they're looking at everything now. Uh, I know mean, there's a bill uh, that was pending in my Judiciary One Committee. We had a hearing on that deals with transgender children. Should transgender girls be competing against uh, biological girls in sports? And I know that the, the NACP has already come out and said, well, we're going to be watching. You know, if you do anything like that now, we're going, we're, we're going to look at pulling our stuff again. It just seems like that is a very, very unfair thing to be done because I think it really puts an unfair burden on trying to pass legislation when you got to sit there and worry about, well, how's the economic effect going to be when these companies and, and the NAC, NACP, NCAA, excuse me, are, are going to leave the state, and you know, which will cost us uh, financial benefit. So uh, I, 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 it takes people to stand up. You know, it's easy for people who uh, are, are for something to let it ride, but we need to stand up for what we believe in and what we want to do to make fair elections. You know, stand behind what we want to do. Explain why it's being done. Explain why it's good for the for everyone. And move forward with it and not be shy or stem away from it just because of some economic threat. If you don't mind, I can, if I don't jump in for just a second on that one. Um, certainly these companies are trying to cover their backside by putting these statements out because they don't want to have uh, boycotts on them. Uh, we have, we've heard people boycotting, you know, Home Depot is trying to stay out of the fray. So now people are going to, you know, are calling for boycotts of Home Depot because they didn't want to talk politics. Uh, so it's not even not even just saying, well, that's not my zone. Um, one of the things that I think will perhaps lessen the impact of actual boycotts is that the, the woke companies tend to be concentrated in your bigger cities, uh, your Atlantas in Georgia. You know, the, the, you know they weren't having the all-star game in, in Macon, Georgia, for example. It was going to be in Atlanta. So the economic impact was in areas that tend to vote Democratic, tend to vote, you know, progressive. We saw that same thing with the boycotts in North Carolina. It was Charlotte and Raleigh that bore the brunt, Greensboro, that bore the brunt of this. And a lot of your voters in other parts of the state are gonna be like, okay, it doesn't really affect me. And that's the reason you saw, for example, Stacey Abrams said, well, maybe, maybe we shouldn't have a boycott. And now she's trying to beg companies not to boycott Georgia because that's that same impact. It, it's kind of uh, unintentional consequences of these. So I, with this, I think a lot of these companies are going to uh, talk a big game, but one, they don't want to do it because it's disrupt, disruptive of their businesses. And two, the progressive allies really don't want them to follow up. So there might be some, you know, flashes, but I don't, I don't see large scale organized boycotts. Maybe I'm being optimistic there. Representative Mills, our own governor, is calling for businesses to speak out on what he says is the right side of history. Your reaction to that? Yeah, Donna, that's exactly what I was going to um, bring up. Uh, you asked the question, what are we seeing? Uh, and to answer your question, uh, it's yes. I mean, what we are seeing uh, from Democrat leaders, uh, that they are willing to politicize everything elections related. And we have that with the letter uh, that our governor signed along with many other uh, Democrats and, and liberals. And the reality is 
this letter does nothing to answer or address the legitimate concerns that voters have and that I hear every day, and I'm sure Representative Davis hears every day and every member of the General Assembly hears every day. There are legitimate questions and concerns from people across our state and across our nation. And the only thing the letter does is politicize the issue, makes it harder to deal with in, in the General Assembly and elsewhere. You know, Chairman Smith, we seem to be living in a time now where if you have a um, politically incorrect point of view that not only can are people willing to very publicly and stridently disagree with you, but they want to, quote, cancel you. You know, they want to shut down your ability to even express an opinion. And I know that you and the folks at the Institute for Free Speech are very concerned about where, where a lot of this is going and the intersection with election integrity and election law. Right. One of the things we're very concerned about at the Institute for Free Speech is a huge portion of this 800-page bill that is H.R. 1, we referenced, the federal bill, uh, contains efforts to uh, regulate speech, make it more difficult to speech, and force uh, people to identify themselves uh, with speech, not just about candidates, but about public affairs generally, so that uh, people will not be able to, to fund privately you know, think tanks and other kinds of organizations where they just want to spread those ideas through society. And of course, part of the reason, there's many reasons why people don't want to be publicly affiliated. Some just don't want other folks bothering them for money too. Some don't have religious reasons for not wanting to do it. Some just want to protect their privacy. Some don't want their neighbors to know how much they have. But a lot of people don't want to do it because they, they don't want to be hassled uh, or they, they don't, they're concerned about others. For example, you might be a CEO of a small company well, you have to be concerned about your employees and your family and your shareholders and so on if the company were to be uh, boycotted or harassed, which keeps you from speaking your own personal views separate from anything that's going on in the business. This is very dangerous stuff. It, it, it takes us very much away from the idea that we, you know, that, that we answer political views we don't like with more speech rather than trying to ruin people's lives apart from the, the speech that they've engaged in themselves. It's, a, it's very dangerous. It's part of the cancel culture. It makes our politics nastier. Uh, and it's something that we really ought to avoid. And one way to avoid that is to allow people to pool their resources. And the speakers identify it. If it's the Sierra Club or Right to Life or NARAL Pro-Choice or, or the NRA or whoever, they're identified. But not every single person who gives them money needs to be identified. And some people say, well, you know, you should be bold and stand up for your views. Well, again, there are many reasons why it's not so simple for others. But the other thing is that ultimately, the First Amendment is there to protect the meek, too. And the meek and the shy may have ideas that it's very good for the rest of us to hear. And we need to keep that in mind. If we drive these people and these voices out of the public arena, our debate becomes impoverished, and we may miss all kinds of great ideas and opportunities. And something that people may not understand, and I know that Chairman Sh uh, Smith, you certainly do, um, is really the sordid history of the push to force nonprofit groups to reveal their donors. And it dates back to the 1950s and the NAACP versus Alabama and um, folks in the South who were trying to uh, force the NAACP to reveal its donor list. And this was, you know, an effort to try to um, thwart the efforts of the NAACP fighting uh, against a discrimination which was very real and very robust in parts of the South. Can you give us just a, a brief little primer on um, what that history was? And, and that was, it was just so ugly. And now the Democrats nationally have revived this effort in H.R. 1. Sure, and it goes to a number of, of different cases. In, in NAACP versus Alabama, which you mentioned, the state of Alabama uh, wanted, was investigating whether the NAACP had correctly registered to do business in the state. And by the way, it probably had not. And the NAACP was pretty ready, ready to admit that and pay any fines and keep doing business. But the state said, well, we need to know all of your donors. Who were your members and your donors? And of course, anybody you know with, who knows anything about the state of affairs in Alabama in the 1950s knows that this could be very dangerous, both physically dangerous to those donors and members, but also, again, just dangerous to their livelihoods, you know, danger, having to worry about their families. I always point out you know, the classic movie, To Kill a Mockingbird, right? It's everybody, almost everybody's seen. The bad guys, the racists, don't go after Gregory, Pick's, Gregory Peck's strong Atticus Finch. They go after his kids. So it doesn't matter if Gregory Peck is brave. 
He's got to worry about his children, his family. And this is the kind of thing there in Alabama. But it's important to note, we shouldn't have to have that great a scenario, you know, that great of, of, a, of a danger. Uh, the Supreme Court in those days, remember, this is what the Hollywood Seven was all about. They made a heroic movie of Dalton Trumbull, you know, because he was blacklisted. And what was that about? They wanted the names of these people who is supporting these various efforts to spread ideas that we don't like. And if we look through history, we see that those are almost all considered sort of black marks on us historically and black marks on the courts when they didn't strike those down. And there's a whole series of cases pertaining to uh, union organizers, proselytizers going house to house, uh, demonstrators, picketers, that you don't have to identify yourself in order to engage in public association or, or, or public debate. Uh, and as you say, it's very odd to see the Democratic Party turn its back on that. Their argument is, oh, well, it's not like it was in the Deep South then. You know, I don't know. A lot of people have lost jobs and a lot of people do feel threatened. And it's not so far-fetched to think that somebody's, you know, given some of the rhetoric, Jim Crow on steroids and so on, that somebody's pushing for, you know, some a two-day cut in early voting might not find a bomb at their business. I don't think that's that far-fetched these days. And it's, it's something to be very carefully watched and thought about uh, before we, we betray all these hard-won victories of the civil rights movement. And that is a component of H.R. 1. It's a gigantic behemoth bill, of course, a resolution, but that is one piece of it. So as we start to um, wind down our time together here, uh, gentlemen, Representative Mills, give us a sense of what you think is, is um, really at the top of your list for election reform and integrity in North Carolina that you really hope to be achieved uh, this session. Well, it goes back to those three points I mentioned um, in my opening remarks, uh, we've got uh, absentee voting. We need to look at that. Uh, we need to work on improving that process. We need to work on clarifying uh, current laws and especially looking at how we can do our best uh, to improve um, getting res election results within a timely fashion. Uh, we don't want the voters out there to be uncertain, uh, you know, what's going on. It's been a week, two weeks, three weeks from the election. You want to avoid those types of problems. Of course, we've talked about the money uh, to local boards. That's something that uh, is concerning to, to a lot of members. And then the uh, sue and settle um, uh, discussion that we had, I think that's an interest to a lot of members and me as well. Representative Davis? Uh, also, uh, to expand a little bit, we also need to look at the voter roll cleanup. I think that's very important to do that and also to address and tighten up the absentee ballots by mail, uh, both of those things. But I'm very encouraged, quite frankly, about where we're going in North Carolina. I know uh, Representative Mills and I uh, in the elections committee, which he chairs, is, is move, moving forward. We're working on things now in the House that are not public yet. Uh, I know the Senate has filed a bill and is, is more public in what they're, they're thinking about and what they're going to do, but we are still working. We are work in progress, but I can assure you that we are moving forward and we'll move forward and, and come out with what uh, uh, the, the committee feels like and hopefully the, the House will support on what will help us uh, ensure our election integrity, which I know is what everybody wants to be done. Indeed, that's what it is all about, to make sure that every legally cast vote is secure and that people can have confidence in these elections and that we can have our robust debates over issues, over candidates, and then once the election is held, that each of us feels like we had our say. It was free, it was fair, it was done with integrity, and then we move on to the next challenge. Uh, if, we, if our person or issue didn't win, we move on to fight another day. And uh, so that's what we're trying to achieve here. And of course, folks, Andy Jackson is our election law expert here at the John Locke Foundation. Be sure to check out johnlocke.org. Andy posts on a regular basis all sorts of interesting information, including writings about the recommendations uh, that he made here during our presentation today. So you want to make sure you check that out. Representative Gray Mills, Representative Ted Davis, Chairman Bradley Smith, and my colleague Andy Jackson. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you being part of this. Thank you. thank you, Donna. And folks, we want to thank you for joining us as well. We are just so psyched that you are so engaged and that you in 
enjoy being part of this every Monday as we talk about the important issues facing North Carolina and North Carolinians. And we're so grateful to have your support. I would ask you to consider this, financial support. If you like what we're doing, we are a nonprofit organization and we do need your uh, contributions to help fuel our work. If you are so inclined, it's very simple and fast to do. Just go to johnlock.org. In the upper right-hand corner, there is a donate tab. Just uh, tap on that. It's secure, it's fast. In less than two minutes, you can make a tax-deductible donation to help us defend and advance freedom and election integrity in North Carolina. We would so much appreciate that and thank you for your support. Hope you're going to have a good week and join us again next week for another edition of Virtual Shaftesbury Society. On behalf of the entire John Locke Foundation and Carolina Journal team, I'm Donna Martinez. Have a great week, everybody.